So we're making adventure games in Unreal. How do we save and load? In an engine like RenPy, it happens automatically. You don't even have to think about it. But in Unreal, we have to do it manually. We do have to think about what we want to save and what we want to load and when to do all that stuff. But it's not as complicated as it sounds. We can sweep almost all of it under the rug. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Let's start with the basics. If you watch any tutorial on saving and loading in Unreal, you're going to find out there are a few nodes that you can use in your blueprints to save and to load. You can name the slots that you're going to save and load into, and you can set a save game and then put some data into it. This is essentially a struct. Essentially, we are saving and loading a struct. What's a struct? A struct is just a bin full of variables. So, for example, if you're watching another tutorial on how to do this, they might give you things you might want to save. The player name. If the player customizes their character's name, you're going to want to restore that name when they quit and then reload. Maybe you save their health. Maybe you save their high score in some minigame. Maybe you store what room they're in so that when they hit continue on the main menu, it loads up the correct level and puts them where they were. Maybe you save their costume because if they customize their appearance, they're going to want that customization to survive saving and loading. These are all variables that we attach to the struct. And when we load the game, we understand when we need each of these variables. So chances are we'll start with this room variable to load up the level we want. And then the player character that gets loaded in will check for its name and its health and its costume. And then the high score can wait until we get around to the mini game much later. Understanding this basic flow is going to be important to understanding how to do any kind of saving and loading. What do you need to save and what do you need to load universally? It can get very complicated if your game is quite complicated. The good news is our game is not complicated exactly. So when we look at this giant list of things, the only one we actually need for our save game in our adventure is here. The only one of these values that we're likely to want to customize is the room. And all we have to do with that is when someone hits continue on the main menu, that tells us which level to load. That's it. But there are a lot of things we want to save, right? Like inventory. How do we save inventory items? If the player picks up an apple, how do we remember that the player picked up an apple? Well, one way to do that would be to create a variable for picked up apple. And then we could set that when the player picks up an apple, and we could check it when we load and all that jazz. But do not do it this way. <clears throat> Creating a variable for every single possible inventory item in the game would be extremely annoying. You'd have to wire all of that stuff up manually every single time anything ever changed. To make matters worse, you're not likely to release a finished game as your first release. It's likely to be Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 2.5, Chapter 1 Remake, Christmas Special, Chapter 2 Remake, right? If you add more values later on in Chapter 2, like, say, a banana they can pick up, pick up, well, congratulations, now your save games are incompatible. Because this is no longer the same struct. It cannot be loaded from the old saved game. You'd have to create some kind of custom checking to see which version of the, of, of the save game struct it is, and then converting it. It would just be a miserable mess. This is not what you want. You want all of your save games from the first chapter to work in the second chapter. So how do we do that? Well, basically all we need to do is uh, use an array instead of individual elements. So we, are, we don't have each individual inventory item with its own variable. Instead, we just have an inventory array. This is an array. That's a symbol for an array. When the player picks up an apple, we add the apple class to the inventory, and then it saves the game. So then when we load, we take a look at the inventory, and we spawn in all of the classes that are in the inventory. 
if the player eats the apple and is removed from the inventory, then we just save it and it's got a shorter inventory list. It's now short an apple. Later on, if we add in gerbils or bananas or whatever else the player can pick up, those are simply more subclasses. Those just get added in and referenced in the same way. The fundamental save game doesn't change shape in any way, so it's always going to be compatible. This is the main secret. Congratulations, you've learned how to save your adventure game. We'll go into Unreal in a bit here and talk about specifics, but there are a couple more things that we probably want to save. Categories of things. Inventory items are a category of thing. Another category of thing is flags. Saving and loading flags is important. A flag is simply something logical that happened. For example, did you flood the palace? If you flooded the palace, we've got a lot of logic that says, okay, well, instead of loading the palace level, load the palace flooded level. Change these four conversations over here. Change that over there. Do this, that, and the other thing. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen if you flooded the palace. So we set that flag, and then we check for it every single place that we would want to do something different. But not all flags are big. A lot of flags are very small. For example, did you get introduced to this character? If you've already been through their introductory dialogue, you don't need to hear it again, so we set that flag and you never hear it again. The last category of thing that I can think of that we might want to save are the things in the game world. Like, did you push a box down a hill? Did you change a number on, you know, uh, a sign? Did you destroy a building? Did you eat something and now it's gone? Those are all actors in the scene and their state is now different. We could do all of that with flags, but that would be a lot of extra work, so it might make sense to save actors as their own separate array of things to keep track of. The only problem is, Unreal doesn't like you doing this, not in Blueprints. You can sort of do it in C if you don't mind coding, uh, some pretty, you know, deep magic stuff, but in general, it's not something that Unreal really recognizes. You can't simply save an actor. So I'm going to show you how to get around that. It's the most complicated part of this, but all of this, all of these arrays, have a secret. They are automatic. You're very rarely going to have to actually look at these things manually. The only times you need to do it is when you're trying to do something a little unusual. For example, if your palace is flooded, you may actually have logic to check whether or not that flag is set, because it's complicated and it's a one-off thing. But in most cases, your, your conversation engine will just say, this conversation is locked to this flag. So we set that flag and we're done, and if that flag is set, we never see that conversation again. You don't have to code that in. That's just available. You just have to use the right object, an object that understands how to check for a flag and set a flag. So you only really have to code that once, and then you just keep using that same object. Same with the actors. Rather than manually saving individual actors, I mean, you can, but more likely you're going to be using a subclass of actor that understands how to save and load itself when its state is changed. So at the end of the day, you don't know, you don't have to know how to save and load things. All you have to know is which items are going to save and load automatically in which ways so that you can take advantage of it. Let's go over into Unreal, put this tablet aside for a second and then switch over into Unreal. All right, here we are in Unreal and here it is. This is the same thing I just showed you. We've got the player room so that we know which level to load. We've got the hoodie wetness, which is basically our customization. That's just how wet you are from the rain. And then we've got flags, actors, and inventory. So flags are just a set of strings. And if you don't know how to make an array like this, you just select that button there and switch it from single to array. And there you go, you now have an array. The inventory item is an inventory item class. So here's our inventory item base object class. We then selected 
class reference. You have to be sure to select the class reference, not an object reference, because an object is something that only exists when the game is running and the game is not running when we're saving and loading the game, that's kind of the point. So, or it's not, you know, it's not related to the saving and loading. So we need to save the class. So when the player picks up an apple, we save the class of apple into our inventory list. And then when we load the game, we say spawn in that class. And again, it's an array. The last thing we do is these actors here. We have to use an actor save proxy, which is just what I've named it. That's just a struct that allows actors to save the various things about themselves that they want to save because, again, Unreal does not like you saving actor. So here's the reference to the actor, which is linked to an object in a scene. Then there's a transform, whether it's deleted, and the flag. And that's it. Almost all of the actors that use this list do so automatically. They do it behind the scenes. They're of a type of actor that understands how to save and load itself. So you don't generally have to manually enter any of that data. If you have something that can be eaten off the table and go away forever, you make it out of the, the uh, type of object that understands that when it's deleted, it should save that it is permanently deleted. Now you might be wondering, okay, well how do I actually integrate all of this into the game? I mean, sure, we've got all of this data that we're going to save and load, but how do we actually make it all work? Well, the secret to that is that we have an adventure game state. A game state is simply something that survives all of the saving and loading of levels. So when the player moves from level to level, the game state remains the same. This is where you would normally store your hit points and stuff like that. Well, we simply store our save game. Here it is. That's it. That means that our save game is always in memory. When we edit this object, this struct, we immediately save it to disk. And later on, we, when we want to start up again, we load it from the disk and load it straight up into this. Which means that whenever you have to reference something in the save game, you just ask the game state and every item in the universe knows how to find the game state because there's only one. So you just say get the game state and check this value and I've got a set of helper functions that just do that with one call instead of having to have a whole bunch of nodes over and over again. That's it. That is the complexity here and what we do is very rarely do we actually manually set these things up. Instead we just let them all happen automatically based on the objects that we're using because every object understands how to save and load itself. Let's give some examples here. So one example would be this conversation that we can have with this lady here. This is an introductory conversation. It only plays once. Once it's played through, it saves the flag that says that we are done with this conversation and it never plays again. That's uh, going to be a little bit annoying though if you are, for example, making that conversation and you need to trigger it a lot. So what we also have is the option to control all of the save and load stuff right here in the scene. The adventure game state, every game state, is spawned in as you hit play. So it's right here in, in, the, in the sidebar. And we can simply go down to here and see we have the option to clear, load, and save. And we can also say, change the save slot's name. Now this is obviously really valuable because we can hit clear save or turn off auto saving so that it doesn't save when we talk to this lady. Either one would work. But we can also save and load from slots that aren't the main slot. So we can create a lot of other slots for debugging purposes. And since our save games are always going to be compatible forwards and backwards due to the way that they're structured, we can create a whole bunch of debug save states and then load those and see how things work and then work on things. So even if you're, you know, working on hour 30 of your game, you can have a bunch of debug saves that have very different backstories to them, different actions that you took, different flags got set, different inventory items are loaded up. But they all work fine when you're testing here. And that's one of the strengths. All you have to do is change the name of the save slot. Now, if you've never seen that, it's actually fairly straightforward. 
all you do is you create your function, clear save in this case, and you set it to be call in editor. As long as the function doesn't take any extra inputs, call in editor will surface it in just the way you saw. This is super handy for a lot of different things and that's why I've got the saving and loading set up the same way. It just really helps us to be able to debug as we go and that's part of it. Now to give you another example, down there you can see that we've got a bunch of closed off um, you know, uh, gateways. So if we come over here, these closed off gateways actually open up after the introduction to this dancer character. Her shtick is that she beats things up until they spark open or fall over. And now they're open and we can walk through. But the thing is that that, of course, is saved. So if we were to escape and then start the game up again, you can see that they're already open. And of course, she won't redo her introduction. If we don't like that, well, we can always clear the save. If we were to take a look at what's actually going on here, we can take a peek in the adventure data and you can see that we set some actors and some flags. Exit door is open and there's an actor quick trigger too. Those are all automatically set. Clear the save and those will go away and then when we load it up they're closed again. See? So the basic idea is that we create objects that understand how to save and load themselves. Now, sometimes they're going to have interconnections that you're going to have to manually create. For example, if you want the, the palace to flood, then you're probably going to have to have some logic that you create custom to have a response to the flooding palace. It's unlikely that you're going to have a custom object that specifically handles that exact logic. It's just overkill to do that. So you would custom put that in with a blueprint. But... For most baseline stuff, like stuff that can open and close, introductions, conversations that have different one, you know, different single elements to them that only get called once, those things are all happening because you're using the right object. You're not manually saying, is that conversation over? Remember to save it. You don't have to do that because the conversation object understands how to save itself. In the same way that when you pick something up, you don't manually say, oh, did you pick up an apple? Remember to save. The inventory understands that every time they pick anything up or lose anything, you immediately save. That's the basic idea behind this kind of save and load system. It's very robust and very straightforward. And obviously, I'm going to have all of the objects that do all of this work for you in my example. I did have to take a month off, though. And I do want to do some more refactoring before it's quite ready. So, uh, you know, progress is slow and not terribly steady, but it's coming. And the basic logic is applicable even if you're just doing it on your own and you don't want to use my examples. So, I hope that helped. See you around.